To get to the heart of Yalta, he and Leora didn't bother to ask Svetlana for directions, but left through the back door, scattering fowl. Kotler led them toward the coast. He flattered himself by thinking that he was navigating from childhood memory, that his sense of the place inhered in him from all those years ago. Closer to the truth was that the town was not very large and sloped downward toward the sea. A few stops on a minibus soon returned them to the tourist center, depositing them near Lenin Square, where, framed heroically by the Crimean mountains, the bronze Bolshevik still stood on his pedestal looking intently out to sea, and peripherally at a McDonald's. In time, Kotler thought, the good citizens of Yalta might resolve, if not to add a pile of bones at his feet, then at least to replace him. Without too much trouble, Kotler and Leora located an internet café, dark as a grotto and occupied mostly by teenage boys wearing headphones and hollering to one another as they shot at Chechens or the Taliban on their computer screens. Kotler had once caught Benzion playing a similar game. A sensitive, studious boy, he was then a student at the yeshiva. Seeing his father's reaction, he'd said shamefacedly, The guys were playing it. Now stationed near Hebron, he was no longer playing. They found two available terminals next to each other at the back of the cafe and began with the Israeli press. It didn't take them long to find what they were looking for. The lead stories in both Haaretz and the Jerusalem Post featured the same photograph of the two of them in the Tel Aviv airport. The photograph captured them as they presented their documents at the ticket counter. It had been taken from a distance, furtively, by another traveler, Kotler presumed, as the professionals never suffered from such scruples. Still, there could be no mistaking their identities, particularly his, though he supposed Leora had now attained a level of notoriety to match his own. Haaretz also provided a companion photo of his wife shopping for Shabbat at a market near their Jerusalem home. In the photo, Miriam looked every bit the aggrieved, steadfast spouse, the victim of her husband's treachery. For the article, she said only that she refused to discuss a private family matter. Kotler could imagine the scene at the market, the pestering, beseeching journalists. But with Miriam, they stood no chance. At this thought, Kotler permitted himself a fond smile. Miriam was a rock. In her time, she had undergone a harsh apprenticeship and was as canny about the press as any image consultant. The reporters could flatter themselves that they had caught her in an unguarded moment, but Kotler would have been surprised and frankly disappointed if Miriam hadn't orchestrated the whole thing, down to the potato in her hand when they took her picture. In both newspapers, the scandal Kotler shared the front page with news of the Knesset's vote in favor of the withdrawal from the settlement block. It had gone as predicted, with the Prime Minister's coalition eking out a narrow majority. Kotler, not wanting to be on record as merely abstaining, had cast his vote the previous day, shortly before his ignominious escape. The Haaretz article listed his name among the notable opponents, prominent among the defectors from the Prime Minister's cabinet. Then there were the obligatory quotes from the various factions, the same choir singing the same song. The Prime Minister cited defensible borders and the welfare of the Israeli state. The Chief of Staff spoke of the army's inviolable discipline. The left rejoiced, the right seethed. The Americans applauded. The settlers pledged bloody insurrection and the Palestinians complained. The din would continue until the operation was executed. What happened then, nobody knew. Nothing good, was Kotler's opinion. The only question was just how bad.